No, we don't. Hi, folks that are joining us. I'm just going to give folks another moment or two just to hop on to our Zoom meeting tonight. Okay. That's a nice turnout. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I don't see Dale there. Not yet. You know what I'll do? Yeah. Actually, I have I have it right here. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Invitations. Let me reinvite Dale and hope he gets it. All right. All right, everyone. Well, I'm just going to do a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Gianna. I'm one of the reference librarians here at the Chelmsford Public Library. So thank you so much for joining us for our program tonight with our Sisters in Crime um, organization presenters. Um, and we're going to be talking tonight about how to take your personal experiences and turn them into mystery stories. So have you been a housewife, a domestic worker, maybe a single parent, lived in a creepy old house? <laughs> You think your life's been boring, but exciting plots can be buried in your own experience. In this discussion, audience members will find the clues to the novel only they can write. So I'm just going to do a brief intro of our presenters tonight. First, we have GM Malier, who is the award-winning author of the acclaimed just uh, Saint Just Mysteries, Max Tudor Mysteries, Suspense Novel, Wakeham, and the numerous short stories collection and crime anthologies are published in Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine and The Strand. We also have um, Dale T. Phillips will hopefully be joining us shortly. He was a student of Stephen King in college. Dale has published the Zach Taylor mystery series and other novels, over 70 short stories, story collections, poetry, and nonfiction. He's appeared on stage, television, Jeopardy included, and in an independent feature film. And then lastly, we have Bonner Spring, who writes eclectic international thrillers. A nomad at heart, she hitchhiked across Europe at 16 and joined the Peace Corps after college. Her award-winning debut, Toward the Light, is set in Guatemala, and the newly released Disappeared takes place in Morocco. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it along to our presenters. Um, and just to let everyone know, please put any questions or comments in the chat during the presentation. That's how we'll answer any questions you have, um, whether it's during the presentation or after. So make sure to put those in that chat at the bottom of your Zoom menu. All right. Take it away, guys. Okay. Hey. And here we go. Here's yes. Dale. Here we are. Oh, my goodness. Hi, Dale. Here's our, here's our, our fearless leader. You missed your introduction, <laughs> Mr. Dale. <laughs> Likes the drum, um, yeah so um so we were going to talk first i think you said about that old adage about write what you know what do you know dale <laughs> <laughs> well okay That's a long well, when you're talking about location you should know something about the location uh one writer i know tossed the book aside because he was reading about a car chase down the main street in Bangkok. And he goes, the main street in Bangkok is a river. So he knew the <laughs> author was a complete idiot, hadn't even bothered to check and just tossed the book aside. And that's what readers will do. Um, if you don't know that Ottawa has the Rideau Canal going through it, or London has the Thames, Paris has the Seine, you know, Boston has its rivers. If you don't know the basics, you're going to get it wrong and readers will let you know by a not reading b giving you bad reviews and c writing you letters nasty nasty letters uh luckily i've i've been to all 50 states and i've lived and worked in a number of them so my novels are based all over i write the portland series uh and the zach taylor series based in portland maine because i love portland and it's a great place to set a mystery as a fish out of water who comes there and finds that it's a Maine is a healing place. But I've also written a novel based in New Jersey, uh, also one based in the desert, also one based in eastern Ohio in former mining country. And it's important to get these details, also one in Canada, uh, in the northern Ontario. It's important to get these details because that is part not only of the mystery, but of the character of the people that inhabit it. And that's critical towards what the story is. 
I've got a friend, uh, yeah, Chris Bernard, and he writes, and his latest book is about Alaska. And the man brings his daughter there and the polar bears attack. And it's just because that's what polar bears do. But that sets the whole novel from then on. I mean, that's it. It's what happens mm -hmm. when tragedy strikes. But again, it's knowing that that's what's particular to that locale. So that's one thing that using what you know to write the mysteries. That's just one aspect. Right. Thank you, Dale. How about you, Chin? Well, since, since we're talking about location, I'm, I'm currently reading Ragnar Jonasson. His, uh, it's a book from a few years ago. Um, and I'm so impressed with the way he can create uh, he can describe Iceland, which of course is where he's from, where he lives, where his, I think most of his stories are set. And that's a, that's a real uh, gift. My uh, stories are set in an imaginary village in England, in Southern England. That's the Max Tudor series. Um, I will stop, I will pause to show you. That's the cover of the latest one, number eight in the series. Yeah. And um, nice. it, it comes from having lived in England. I lived there five years. I visit as often as I can going back there this year. But a lot of it is just that's where I want to be. And that's it's in my my memory. And I just, you know, I read the Telegraph and all the British papers. So I'm kind of steeped in it. So that's my research more so than living there, which, of course, is bucket list for me. I want to to buy a place there and live <laughs> right now it's not it's not working out but uh there's something to be said for you get the gist and you know it in your bones and then you just make up mm -hmm. things from that point right yeah i, think I do Dale think yeah well both of you have said yeah, well both of you have said about really knowing your environment i think is extremely important um i've been really lucky in in my international thrillers to have spent a lot of time overseas and i can see that happens i have to say that one of the best early um recommendations i got was from um, someone who read my Guatemala story, my debut novel, Toward the Light, he said he, he read it with his his atlas on his lap <laughs> so that he could see, no, so he could see where everyone was going and how it was going. And it it, it made a lot of it made a lot of a lot of sense to him. So what should we talk about next, guys? Dale, you have an idea? Yes. Um getting the details right. It's I was writing um I went to the Manchester Museum of Art. Uh, the Courier, and I saw a painting by Edward Hopper, one of my favorite uh, 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 painters, and I've written a series of stories based on Hopper paintings. This one was called Bootleggers, and it's this large canvas of three men hunched in a boat just offshore, and on the shore is a kind of Norman Bates-looking house with mm -hmm. one light in the upper window and a shadowy man standing on the shore looking at these three characters hunched in, and it's just called Bootleggers. I wrote this great story about this, and someone who read it said, oh, if you're talking about bootleggers off the coast of Maine and Prohibition, you need to mention Will Frost. So I did some research. Will Frost was this fantastic boat builder called the Wizard of Beals, a place in Maine, and he made these boats that were so good that all the all the bootleggers and rum runners wanted one because they could outrun the Coast Guard. So I put that detail in, and I actually was contacted a couple of years later by a woman who said, how do you know about this? And I said, well, you know, I heard about it. I did some research. She said, I married into the family, the Will Frost family, and they still make boats there. And we were just so tickled to see that detail being remembered in your story. And I went, that's lovely. That's that's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I saw That's that exhibit. Great. If you're talking about the one at, in uh, near Gloucester, I went to the Edward Hopper Hopper exhibit last year. Mm. It, I don't know. If I, that, I, I love Hopper's paintings thing. because they're all beautiful stories. I mean, I've, it's such a prompt. Just looking at one of his paintings goes, "Well, I can write a story about that." It's, it's very evocative, really. Yeah, writing what you know. You know, you know what those characters could be seeing and feeling you know you can mm -hmm. you can create something around what you see on the canvas because you know there's a story and to mm -hmm. me that's a wonderful thing in two dimensions to be able to create a story about people and just two dimensions using paint it's just fascinating to me 
Yeah. Yeah. As a person, maybe yeah, he had that, some flaws, but he could really paint. Yes, I said, yeah, all of them, uh, Picasso, <laughs> Hopper, you know, they're, they're all, even Oppenheimer. Right. Right. And that's, right, and that's just painters, it's not authors, right, guys? So we're all Right, really authors people. are always just the best people, you know, never any there problems, they always treat their spouses mm -hmm. and lovers well. <laughs> right, and, right. and none of us have ever murdered anyone in real life, is that true? Uh, no, no convictions, Oops. so there's that. Okay. All right. Okay. But we need to I, I know, to, you know you real know methods how. of murder. You know, I, I see on TV, I see bodies that have been dead for half an hour and they're still bleeding. And I go, no, no. Don't you people know right. anything about it? <laughs> it's like, I want to write an article. It's like what they always get wrong. They they usually always get, you know, the murders wrong, the fight scenes wrong. They always get sword fights wrong. And as a sword fight aficionado, that's one thing, using what you know. And then, you know, I think I've used it once or twice. But in poker. Poker should be easy for them to get right, and they always get it wrong. I know poker, and I'm like, even a movie like Rounders, and it's like, no, and James Bond, they used it on a James Bond movie, and they're so off with it, it's just aggravating. You sit there grinding your teeth because you're like, mm -hmm. no, don't you know that? Get somebody who knows what to do to help you out with that. What I'm writing most recently <laughs> it has to do with sword play and uh, the Vikings. We and talk. <laughs> I, I sort of like, oh my, why did I do this? But I'm I'm doing it sort of tongue in cheek, which helps because no one expects the screenwriter in this case to be accurate or the director to know what he's talking about. I do. You know? So <laughs> I, I, I'm using that as my out because for one thing, there's very little known about the Vikings and no one's ever seen a Viking actually, you know, killing someone with a knife. And it's just, you know, you go from your imagination a lot. This one really makes me wonder my, at my choices because it's going to be hard. To do. It's going to be really hard. To so right. all those watching, right, do use our never own. check our search yeah. history. This is how we find things out to what we don't know. And this is how we go down rabbit holes that will suck up all of our time. Lord. Yeah, historical. And that is an exactly. excellent, excellent segue. <laughs> right. Because we know a lot of stuff, but. Um, I don't know guns, for example. You were talking about sword fights, and I don't know guns. Mm -hmm. And I'm not that interested in learning about guns because I could study it for years and someone would still say, no, the whatever gun doesn't do this, you have to right, do that. That model was so two my years uh, go, you know, late. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah many all of those stuff. Really so basically how you do it is say, it was silver and there was a black hole in the center and it was pointed directly at me. And that's all you have to do, basically. And please, please, okay. mystery writers, all writers, do not use the smell of cordite. Every other mystery novel or crime novel has that in their books because they Did don't know what they're talking honey? about. Cordite was not has not been used since World War II. It was used in ammunition. Mm -hmm. And it's not used, and people are still using it because they it sounds cool. The smell of cordite. But it's like it's it's one of those details that anybody who knows just like throws the book away because it's like you really don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's why, again, using what you know is so important. And what you don't know, at least find out. Yep. You have to be careful. I use a lot of poisons out. because I read a lot of Agatha Christie. And um, very rarely will I wander into the firearms arena because that is there. That is especially a field where everybody knows everything and they will tell you, you know, at great length if they have to, that, it, you know, this is the, the kind of bullet that goes in that kind of gun. And in World War II, they did this and that. And it just... Uh, if, I went on Facebook to ask for advice because I knew I was out of my depth and I got very, very good advice from real experts. But man, it's like, wow, how do you even know this? They're fanatics. They're fanatics about, I mean, people have their hobbies. If you talk about stamp collecting, you really better talk to a stamp collector who knows their stuff. Because it's like if you, you know, talk about the upside right, down right. Jenny, you know, um, stamp so and you get the date wrong. You will get letters, you will get comments, you'll get bad reviews, people showing up at your door to harangue you. Absolutely. So, but in yeah. general. Well, you know, maybe we should pivot to talking about 
what we do know. You know what I mean? How what we know and how it impacts what we write about. Like um, when uh, Janella, uh, Gianna introduced us all, she mentioned, well, places we live, jobs we have, things that we do. So here I am, I'm a teacher, I'm a parent, I go on vacations a lot, I travel, I have hobbies. But how does that impact like the story, you know, the stories that I want to write, you know, I, I don't write about being like, let's say a teacher, like generically, what does it take, you know, to, to me? And for me, it's all about the emotional connection or something very up close and specific about it. Like, okay, you're a teacher. What does that mean? Well, one thing it means is what we've been talking about before. And that was a good introduction that it's, um, it's knowing the details, like we've all said, but to write a story about it, there has to be something that catches our attention, that moves our emotions, you know, uh, stopping fights in school, a, a, a student who has an issue or something like that. So is there anything else in your lives that sort of approach that sort of thing, the emotional the emotional context of, of, of writing about uh, things that you know about? Yes. And... Uh... Working so many different jobs and quite a variety of jobs all over, I learned all about society and working in resorts also, seeing everybody from the lowest on the ladder to very rich people and understanding how the strata of society interacts mm. and feels and behaves. And seeing that uh, gives you a better understanding rather than you know, if you're Emily Dickinson and just writing about what you know from your limited view of Amherst, but she was able to go beyond and write about death and write about life and other characters. For some other people, it's like knowing how different people react in different situations, depending on their upbringing, depending on their class, depending on where they're from, so many factors. And having a varied background is, is critical for a writer of knowing what's what. And I write about a, a, a character who has substance abuse issues in his past. And I've had people come up to me and say, excuse me, but I read your book and I, I have substance abuse issues and you nailed it. You get it right. His struggle every day about what he's going through and how what he has to overcome just to get through the day is spot on. And I'm like, thank you. That, that means a lot to know that you got it right. I mean, to someone and that it matters. Mm -hmm. But you didn't know that. It's from, it's I've, I've <laughs> talked to other people and I've known people with these issues, as a matter of fact. So I, I have had that experience in my life of having people with these issues. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of it, I, I grew up in the, the military, moved around, lived all over the place. Mm -hmm. I'm not, there, nothing specific to that shows up in my books but i think when you grow up that way you learn to pay attention to other people and their mannerisms and, and what they might do next you're a little bit if you're like me you're a little bit wary because you know thrown into yet another situation where maybe i'm not i'm not ready to to get to know this new set of people yet so i'm going to check them out and i'm going to see if they if this looks like a nice person i can talk to mm. you know i think that's part of the the thing I think reading a lot, I think we all there's no question we all have read our favorite authors and maybe wanted to emulate them and notice their little tricks of observation, all that sort of thing. I was a big fan of Robert Bernard. I'm not sure if anyone knows who he is anymore. I mean, he's been gone a while, but he was just this terrifically uh, amusing British author. I have a thing about British authors anyway. I just, I just, <laughs> we can <laughs> tell. <laughs> yeah. But their, their use of language is so, you know, starting with Shakespeare, they never, you know, dropped that standard somehow. It's just very, usually very funny wordplay. Well, that's the thing with Sherlock Holmes because he would know something about an obscure detail that the reader would not know, but he would go, oh, the length of the ash on the cigar was X long, so I know he was sitting there for 12 minutes, so he couldn't possibly have been there. Or he knows something about such a fact that 
it's almost cheating for the reader because they're like, well, I wouldn't have known that. How would I have known that? And the inferences he makes from that are almost magical, which is what leaves, you know, Watson so dumbfounded. It's like, <laughs> but, but again, <laughs> he knows it, but the reader doesn't. So it's important to keep that balance if you're introducing something. Uh, someone I had in a class when I was teaching at Cape Cod Writer Center said, oh, I went to the Stetson factory and I can talk for three days about Stetsons. How much detail should I put in the story? There you go. And I go, well, okay, put in <laughs> one really good detail that nobody else knows that makes you sound like the authority. Mm -hmm. One good detail is sometimes all that's necessary. And you've got all those three days of, of talking about it that goes into one line. Yeah. Right. Please don't that's tell us actually more than that's the a, one line. Yeah. Right. That's so, so, we, so is the takeaway from that something like um, write what you know, but don't write all about oh, you know, leave your research you know. <laughs> on the computer and put in just <laughs> enough to make it matter in the story yeah that's right yeah. that's that's yeah. great well that's great. um i i was i was i wanted to um i wanted to talk about um my experience with what i know um and Drugs. how it actually could <laughs> No, that wasn't going to be my answer. Oh, you? oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, no, it, it's you know, I I expect I expect that the three of us, uh, and pretty much everybody listening to us here tonight has had the experience. Oh, I don't know. You're you're driving from your your house to where you work, and something weird happens and you go, oh, that's, that's weird. That's interesting. I, you know, I'd like, I, you know, I'd like to write about that. We can't write all of those stories, right? None of us can write all of those stories, but what is it that makes the emotional impact that, that turns something that's weird into a story? Okay. I'm going to very briefly say that the very first short story I ever had published came from this one, this very one small thing. So I want everyone here who's not a writer, who's thinking about writing, um, imagine this, I'm driving to work, I'm getting on Interstate 95 at the entrance that I always take, and parked just before the highway is a white, one of those nondescript white transit vans, and a man has gotten out of the transit van, and he's picking up uh, a metallic sign, the kind of thing that people stick on the sides of their cars, you know, to, to say their business name. And he's picking it up and he's putting it in the back of his van. And I thought, this man is going to commit a crime. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, you guys are nodding at me. Yeah. This man wants to disguise his van by looking like something else when he commits his crime. And that's the small thing sometimes that sets us apart, right? Do you have anybody have a story about that or anything? Well, first I would hide the license plate also. Just put <laughs> your mud on it. That's also, that's true. Yeah, I didn't see the mud part, but I did see the picking up the. It was a purp. It was a purple and gold sign, and you know, I just thought you put that on the side of the van, and nobody's going to see the van even anymore, right, Jen? Well, you know, I, anyhow, everything everything is a white van. Every crime committed is comes out of a white. Yes, van. Yes, that's the serial killer uh, standard model. <laughs> Where I yes, happen to be living uh, just south of Washington D.C. Now I'm in Alexandria, uh -huh. Virginia. And the, the, there was a Beltway, a horrible... Uh, the sniper, crime, right? The sniper. Oh, and somebody reported yes. that they saw them get into a white van. And for the longest time, you couldn't not see a white van. It just seemed like every car was a white van. And it turned out it Absolutely. wasn't a different car altogether when they did finally catch those two. But um, yeah, it, it was remarkable. The proliferation of white vans and everybody's imagination um, also going to like Lowe's or the uh, the hardware store uh, over a parking lot mm. and so mm -hmm. doing this marine maneuver to to not be you know easy to train sights on that was the weirdest thing but we were all doing it mm -hmm. so thank yeah. god they caught them yeah That's well right. I had um a writing prompt in a writing group he said we all should write a story called titled the easiest man to kill and I went, oh, absolutely, I'm going to write a story about that. 
And as I was turning it over in my mind, I was thinking about uh, a song by Tom Russell, which is about the death of Bill Haley of the Comets. He died in a small border town in Texas in total obscurity, and his last days were drinking and possibly mental illness or something, and it was bizarre. And so I wrote this story taking that, what I knew about the death of Bill Haley, the location, the time, the feeling, and of what possibly might have happened. And I put that mm -hmm. in to the story. And it's it's great because it's somebody who blames him for something because of his rock and roll explosion that he sparked. Somebody blames him for bad things that happened. And if they're coming after him, but it's at the end of Bill Haley's life and he's already killing himself with the alcohol, with the everything else. So the man says, it was the easiest man to kill. <laughs> kind of hey. a, why bother? He was well, because him. you want to be the agent of their destruction. You want payback. You want mm -hmm. closure. You need. You don't just let them. You do it, and because it's quicker and it's you doing it rather than them letting the natural order of things take over. Mm -hmm. And again, that's what revenge is in the human heart. You know, I'm. I've got a lot, I know a lot about revenge and anger, so I use that in a lot of my stories. <laughs> we were at a conference once and people said, oh, you know, mystery writers, they, they always write about what they know. So Hank Philippi Ryan writes about an investigative reporter who solves mysteries. And Steve Ulfelder writes about a, a, a race car driver who knows about cars. And they turn to me and I go, I wrote about, I write about an angry ex-convict alcoholic who, who wants to kill people. And they look at me and everybody moves away. And that's a, but that's what we do. That's <laughs> right. That's what we do. No. And a lot of times it's it's met it's melding what we what we know with things that we 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 don't we don't know. I think we've already gone over this just a little bit, adding pieces that we actually do have to look up online and get in trouble for possibly. The wisdom to know the difference. I mean, really. I often I find myself writing and then I'm in the middle of, this, of a sentence and I think, I really don't know what I'm talking about here. I think I'll go and see what Google has to say about this this uh, topic, this location, right. this color, you know, it could be anything. And then six hours wrote, later. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know how we wrote books before we had the internet. I cannot remember right. doing it or going to the library and pawing through the books. I just, you know, it's so, so much easier now and so much so many more distractions, but so much easier to put something it's, up. It's really funny. I interviewed, a, I run a podcast called Crime Wave with Bonner Spring, and I interviewed a man this morning who was talking about the his his pandemic book, basically, which has just come out. And he talked about, and his whole point was being at home, and he couldn't go anywhere, and he didn't talk to people, but he had his computer, and he looked up everything, you know, on the computer. What did we do before Google? Yeah, my pandemic book was called Augusta Hawk. And she's basically oh. looking out the window at the neighbors and sees something that looks suspicious. Because, you Ooh. know, what else, what else are you going to do? <laughs> what else? Yeah, exactly. Um, the the exactly. advantage in using what you know applies because we as writers, the good writers, we're using all the senses to create a story, mm -hmm. you know, not just the sights and the sounds, but the smells, the feel of things. If if you've never ridden an elephant, you know, feeling <laughs> that skin, smelling the elephant, seeing the, the view from up there, but it's mm -hmm. that sort of detail, which matters and getting mm -hmm. the details right. That's why it's like what you know, doing the thing lets you know a lot more. Having been to a location lets you get all those senses in, you know, obscure little detail. What is the sound the traffic makes or not mm -hmm. traffic if it's if it's in a forest what are the sounds that you actually are hearing uh, what are the smells research. what are the what what does it feel like did you ride the elephant if it, i mean i don't think even google knows what it's like to ride an elephant but having said that i'm sure it's probably a youtube <laughs> <laughs> but yes yes doing okay, it but, but doing it is is important yeah yeah it is uh, so much yeah. of this is we, we make up a lot of stuff I think we know a lot, but if I if my day job were as an accountant, well, I could do accounting type crimes. I can do I could do money crimes, but basically, mm -hmm. we just make it up. 
I, speaking but we of have to stuff. sound like we know what we're That's talking right. about. That's the tough part because yeah. people will let you know if you if you're not. Mm -hmm. There was actually uh, a woman I ideas from the newspaper, and there was a recent case where a woman was stealing from her uh, employer. It happened to be a restaurant, and she was making up employees and sending them real checks, but they were make believe employees. She did this for years. And I thought, if, if I can't make a story out of that, I just, you know, I'm going to hang up my my pencil. You know, it's just it's just the craziest thing to think you can get away with it. And then you do for several years and you think you, you get sloppy and she got caught. I still don't know how, but she did it for years. Anyway, that's, you know, the idea. Of where do you get your ideas? I get them from the newspaper a lot. <laughs> yeah. And some of the things that are happening in the news right now, if you wrote them, people would go. Oh, that's just too weird. That would never happen. <laughs> I tell people the trouble with fiction versus real life is that our fiction has to sound plausible and things that are happening now just are so crazy. You, if you'd written them, people would have, you, you never would have got published and people would have thought you're insane and had you locked away. And the truth is actually far worse than anything we can dream up. But we have yeah. to sound in the story like we know what we're talking about. Even if we're talking about that's something like right. a werewolf or uh, Rich Feidelberg says that's why he writes fantasy. But you you need to know the memes and the tropes of dragons. You need to know what this sword and sorcery genre is like, what people are expecting mm -hmm. in the story. What, what kind of magic system are you using? And it should sound plausible, not just anything can happen. No, no. In, in good stories, the magic has rules. Okay, there's there's certain rules you must follow. There's certain themes and tropes that you have to listen to and at least acknowledge and either go with or go against mm -hmm. writing what you know. If, if he's writing fantasy and he gets it wrong, people are going to let him know. Mm -hmm. that's and that's an excellent segue, isn't it? Because um, because each of the various subgenres of what we're talking about mainly tonight, mystery, suspense, thriller, um, has their own expectations, you know. Um, Jen, are you writing mainly, uh, you call it uh, police procedural mysteries? Mm, yeah, it, it's a traditional mystery. Uh, traditional. Very much inspired by Agatha Christie. And mm -hmm. definitely I've read all of her stories at least once, probably twice. Yeah. And you have to because she thought of all the plots ever in the world. And the best you can do is try to you know spin a, a different a different plate just slightly you know different but she really thought of every possible construction for a mystery <laughs> she, she hasn't been yeah. replaced i'm still the biggest fan yeah, that's right that's well right. my zach taylor series uh because the character is an amateur sleuth he does not use a gun but he goes up against people who do so I think I thought that would make a far more interesting series because in too much mystery fiction, somebody whips out a gun and all the problems are solved. All the danger goes away and they win the day just by whipping out. A gun. I'm like, that's not how life works. <laughs> not at all. I, I've not been in a situation where that has actually been the case. However, <laughs> um, this character <laughs> is experienced in the martial arts. And again, he's got a good reason for being that way because of his past mm -hmm. story, his backstory. He got into the martial arts to try to control his anger, his guilt, his emotions, to try to stop from being so angry and wanting to hit people all the time. And that has led him to this lifestyle. But again, you need to have, if you're writing the fight scenes, people say, wow, your fight scenes are so cinematic, they're so real. It's because you've got to know what you're talking about if you're writing about the martial arts in a good fight scene. Knowing what you can do and what you can't do is, is critical. Who are your uh, heroes, Dale? Your your author heroes. Author heroes. I have several dozen, if not hundreds. But I grew up on the school of uh, Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, Johnny McDonald, Robert B. Parker, James Lee Burke. That style, that that harder edged um, of violence, leaves a stain. It's very important. It's not just mm -hmm. a it's not just, oh, somebody gets killed, uh, the crime is solved, and everybody goes, goes back to life. No, no. These are uh, mysteries where it just rips apart the fabric of local life and the people involved. It leaves a stain. It leaves a mark. There's, there's trauma involved. And 
because that's what real murder does. I mean, people have stories, but if they've experienced that, it's just, it's, it, it stains their life and they have to live with that for the rest of their life. And that's what's critical. But also there's other, other, so many other authors, Harlan Ellison, Robert Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, Ray Bradbury. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. Let's see the latter, Shirley Jackson. Uh, okay. And again, you know, mm -hmm. Agatha Christie, Dorothy Sayers, obviously, Sherlock Holmes, but so many others I read widely and in other genres as well. And that gives you the background to write. I mean, I don't write just mysteries. I write fantasy. I write horror. I write science fiction, uh, some magic realism, some nonfiction. But again, it's it's having a varied background. My, my idol is Harlan Ellison who knew everything about everything. It's like, you could just mention a topic and this is before the internet and he would be able to talk about it. And if you said, write a story about that right now, he would sit down and write a story about that. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Stephen King is a, is a awesome. wonderful teacher and he has such a breadth of knowledge about so many things that when you read his books, you feel what the character's feeling because he makes it real. He, mm -hmm. he lets you feel like, you know, almost like you're that character, at least you know them. I mean, when he wrote Salem's Lot, I went, oh, my God, you're writing about the town I grew up in. Oh, how did you do that? <laughs> how was he your teacher? Right. I mean, you were in a yes, yes. Uh, class with him. I or? went to the University of Maine and he came back for one year to teach his writer in residence. And mm -hmm. I got to take all the writing classes from him. I actually got to sit in his living room while he's editing my story. And I go, this is like the coolest thing ever. So with that background, I had to become a writer with, okay. with that kind of training. Oh yeah, I saw That's his house. Awesome. Very That's strange. He, they <laughs> said, you know, that the house I mean, that he loves to put on put on the act and and yeah. and have fun with people. You know, make the scary face and do all that. But he, he's the nicest, most down to earth person you'll ever want to meet. Uh, I'd say normal is pie, but normal for Maine. <laughs> yeah, uh, I people say, do you have nightmares? He says, no, no, I don't have nightmares. I write them and give them to everyone else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Salem thought was the most awesome. terrifying book I ever read, ever, ever, ever. I can't go back and read it. How about you, Bonnet? Bonnet, what are your uh, um, heroes? These, Irwin's. yeah, these days I'm, um, I'm, I'm very into the, um, the evocative slow burn mysteries of people like uh, Peter Heller and William Kent Kruger. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm gonna Jane Harper. Um, I, I I I love the combination of putting uh, people and settings together and having something weird happen. Someone just wrote in the notes. Um, Anat Aniha. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. One of my favorites right now is Harlan mm -hmm. Coben. I don't know that Harlan Coben has the best command of language ever but carlin hoban can tell a story that will keep me like on the edge of my seat until wherever he also does something else i'm talking about harlan coben right now he also does something else that i particularly like and i know we all come from different places he puts the every man in a story i'm not particularly interested in ninja warriors that have like 32 different ways to kill you you know without like even breaking into a sweat yeah spy like thrillers i'm like i can't i can't you know <laughs> they're too perfect yeah. well i mean they're fine and i i know there there are a lot of people out there who enjoy them and they'll make a lot of money on them but that's not my jam right now i really appreciate the fact and in in my books too they're they're people um I would say I would say similar to what William Kent Kruger puts in his, but my sleuths are all amateurs who find themselves in a difficult situation and try to figure out the, the best the best way out of it. Um, there's a really long question here. Are you writing Dale, or is somebody else writing? Yes, because I am. I'm, but I'm uh, I think it. of Tony Hillerman. You cannot separate yeah. the location from what come. the stories are about. Absolutely. That's exactly right. Tony Hillerman is another excellent example of that. So those are the people I look to. I mean, obviously, I write international thrillers. So a big part of what I'm doing is the setting of where I'm going. And um, and when I wrote my my um, the book that came out recently, uh, uh, which is called Disappeared, um, this sort of goes back to something I was thinking about a while ago. It's like, OK, so you go on vacation and like lots of cool things happen to you. So what do you write about? Um, the thing that doesn't happen, in... the thing that goes really wrong. Oh, bless your heart, Dale. That was not a setup. 
You just said that, didn't you? That's so cool. No, that's no, that's ex no, but it's exactly it's exactly that emotional thing. So I'm getting on the red eye from um from New York uh to 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 Marrakesh. Get off the plane. I'm traveling with a friend. Her suitcase doesn't arrive. Oh. Okay, we're exhausted. It's early morning. Her suitcase isn't there. She says, you stand here by the bag of the baggage carousel with our other stuff, our carry-ons in my bag, and I'll go figure out, you know, what we're supposed to do. And she was gone. I, I, and I don't definite, speak. definite. We can start from there. Okay. That's, that's what happens. Okay. I, I don't speak Arabic. I mean, my French is decent, but, and everybody is, they're, they're not playing the, 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 the rules. I mean, the guys with the tan suits and the carts loaded with 30 suitcases are rolling past me and my friend doesn't come back. Okay. She comes back. Fine. We have a great vacation, but everything else that happened in the two and a half weeks we were there was filtered through the, the hell would I have done? You know, what's going on here? Yeah. And that was the story of, hello, what's the name of the book? Disappeared. Mm. And that's okay. what people ask happen. us where our ideas come from. Right. It's and like that's exactly where the ideas twisting come. life it, it 90 was, degrees. There you go. Exactly what it is. It's like things happen to all of us. Those of you who are listening who are writers or who are thinking about writing, it's like, look at, you know, it's the it's the what ifs of life, you know? Mm -hmm. Sally Milliken wants to know that. if we have suggestions to help with writing good historical mysteries. Historical. I saw that, and I I don't know anything about historicals. You go research, research, research. Yeah. Uh, that needs to be <laughs> at least your hobby, if not your your obsession. If you're writing historical mysteries, know what they ate, know what they dressed with, know how they lived, know how they spoke, know what their aspirations were. You know. Read your Jane Eyre, you know, read your novels mm -hmm. of the period, whatever period it is, read the history and read the fictionalized history of what is about that. If you're writing about Henry VIII, you got to know something about Henry VIII, you know? Um, yes, talk to research uh, librarians because they know everything. They are absolutely the people. They know to talk everything. To. Okay. Oh, and you know what's really cool, though? The 60s and 70s are now considered historical. Just saying. <laughs> and I love them. Oh, my God. Yeah, I'm, I'm ancient history. Oh, Aaron wants to know if okay. we've ever been reined in by an editor for adding too much life, tale, life detail or chastised for adding too little. And if it was educational. Yes, I've had editors say, oh, the readers won't know this word. And my response is, well, they should look it up then. I mean, I'm not getting things in there for the sake of just you know trying to show off i'm getting them in there because that's an integral part of the story i used dojo which is a common term known by anybody in the martial arts and and she didn't know what it was and i'm like well i'm sorry that's pretty important mm. i think the weirdest thing i ever most my editors haven't really commented a lot on my books they tend to pass pass through but i had this weird exchange with, I better not name names, but uh, they thought the <laughs> chapter was too long and wanted me to break it into two chapters. And I disagreed, I think mainly because I just didn't feel like remembering all the chapters. I mean, I'm I'm just evil, you know, but it just became a <laughs> thing. And I thought, why are we even, you know, it doesn't matter, just change the chapter numbers. I'll, okay, okay, I'll do it. But that was the, the most severe argument that ever came up. I was hoping for more, uh, you know, I'd have to travel to New York and discuss the plot points and stuff. It never, it just really never happens. Mm -hmm. That's good. If you're not um, fighting with your editor, that's a good place to be in. I think so. Yeah, I, think I don't like to good. fight. Yeah. I'm taking I, the I, I tend to oh. about um, the unreliable narr narrator. Can we talk about? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, back to Agatha Christie with um, the one book she wrote that was so sneaky. Mm. Roger Rabbit, uh, um, Roger Ackroyd. <laughs> no, yes, well, that, Roger yeah. Ackroyd. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That was probably the the king of uh, uh, unreliable narrators. But this one was called it was a uh, three words, and now I've blanked on it. But you never guessed oh. until the absolute very last chapter that this guy was the crook. You just never saw it. She was so 
good, not, not maybe at hiding his emotions, but not, not allowing us to see anything but the surface of what he said and what he did. And underneath it all, it, of course, it meant something else. It's a hard act to pull off because the reader should not feel cheated, mm -hmm. but should, <laughs> should have that dawn of comprehension, like in the sixth sense and go, oh, I should have seen that. And then that's the revelation that makes the whole thing matter. How could I miss that? Um, How could I miss that? Um, I do think there's been a lot of cheating in in, in um, unreliable narrators lately, yes, and that yes. might that might just be my um, uh, my snarky up, update on it. It's just, it's very popular. Um, ever since um, Gone Girl, we've been deluged with them. Mm -hmm. It's a whole bang now, and um, and some of them are excellent and and um, you know whatever right. um, it, it's the fair the fair play is what's important um as you suggested i didn't understand uh, Bond girl until i saw the movie and then i went oh no i well, understand the book i didn't like it because again i'm like why do i care about these self-obsessed yuppies mm -hmm. and if i don't mm -hmm. care at the start i don't care to spend that much time with them if i'm not emotionally invested in something of the characters in a book mm -hmm. when i started out the, the plot, the characters, the story, something, mm -hmm. or the writing, mm -hmm. it doesn't make it to the end. I mean, we use a critical filter. Not every reader does, but I think readers will like, uh, if they read a book they don't like, they will toss it aside. We have, unfortunately, an advanced filter that really screens out a lot. I mean, a lot of books just don't make the cut. Yeah, I have given up on books lately. I never used to do that. It's a code of honor. I'm going to finish this book. I started reading. We only have so many books left in us. We have exactly. to do that. I don't I don't have time if you if you haven't grabbed me yeah. about 50 or 100 mm -hmm. pages. I thought Girl on a Train, I really invested in the, the character, knowing how vulnerable she was and how messed up and how she was missing everything because she just wasn't there to pay attention. Which is a great lead into the question that Lini has is, how does a writer handle the experience of emotion and perspective? She struggled with abstract descriptions of emotion as a kid who loved reading, could not match the, the psychological and physiological experiences about the emotions, and even as an adult wondered about different sensations, which, mm. how does writing an unreliable narrator uh, go about conveying this information? See, that was a perfect lead in. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Right. I know that I can answer well, that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, Jen gave the perfect the perfect answer to that is that, um, despite the unreliable feature, the narrator has to be someone that one can relate to at some level. Yes, not um, not a psychopath, not someone who's um, plotting or you think they're plotting to kill their husband or their wife or, or something like that. That'll work in short no, stories, but for novel length, it's much tougher, much tougher to pull off. You know, that's a that's a good point. Short stories have, a, you know, you're in and out of someone's head in 17 pages, which is a hell of a lot different than 300, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Different skill set, isn't it? Um, how and that leads us to an obvious question. Short. How long should a chapter be? How short is too short? And should you have chapter numbers or titles? I, I, titles. Prefer, I do not prefer chapter titles. And I just, I've been reading a lot of manuscripts lately that title every chapter. I'm like, no, nah, just, just, just title it and I'll, I'll get it in the text. You know why I like chapters? Because it helps me keep track of where I am when I'm writing the book. I, I, oh, he was talking to his boss or something. And I know that the, the you know, the name. Well, yes, for us. I mean, but as a, as a reader, so. I like it as a reader too. And okay. I think 10 pages is perfect to be specific. Exactly 10 pages is perfect for a chapter length. I generally my come in in my novels about one to 2,000 words. Some are a little shorter possibly and some are a little longer, but that's, mm -hmm. that's the reason I aim for because it's usually a scene or two, not mm -hmm. much more. Uh, chapters can be broken down into scenes. What's important? What's driving the story forward? What are these characters wanting? And then if you're changing drastically, I know a lot of thriller writers, sorry, Bonner, uh, like to jump, you know, with even within chapters of here to here to here to here. They're head hopping, they're location hopping, they're time hopping. It's like, 
I uh, don't I prefer do that. that. You I don't. Never good. Do that. Good. Never. You are the good writer. <laughs> yes, I am the good writer. I also don't use titles. I use I just use chapter numbers, and my chapters run seven to eight pages. Um, I um I'm I, I so about fifteen hundred words right now. Yeah, about. Um, and, and I and I don't count the words so much as I count kind of just like what you were saying, Dale, a scene or two to get us to move the story along just a little bit. I have one guy who writes regularly four, uh, excuse me, four page chapters, which I find too choppy. And um, at 10 pages, I think they're running a little bit. I think they run a little yeah, bit. Patterson has his uh, three page, you know, yeah. thousand word yeah. or if, yeah. if that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, that's yeah, not my exactly. style. Okay. Not our style. And, and so, so for the person who asks that question, um, you know, you can decide because there's a lot of variation. Yes, we all do it differently. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the story. Totally. Um, yeah, it does. And it depends on the style of book you're writing. If you're writing a historical mm -hmm. novel or you're writing a literary novel or something, things can take more time. I mean, yes, and yes. if you're writing the action thriller and you just want it quick and punchy for the pacing of it, you'll write shorter, quicker chapters. Uh, and as far as chapter mm -hmm. titles, Tristram Shandy, you know, everything's got a particular title and some people love them and some people just like, eh, mm -hmm. I don't care. But again, you're not mm -hmm. going to hurt anybody by putting them in. No, absolutely not. I have enough to roll writing. Never mind, you know, like putting titles on my chapters. <laughs> And now he says, thank you that we've been helpful. And there is a middle ground. And I write what you want to. The, the great thing is, is there are no rules. There's some guidelines. But again, you are allowed to do whatever you want, to tell the story you want in the manner you want, in the style. And you can cut or you can lengthen as much as you want, as long as the reader is not bored. If the reader is following your story, and this is where your beta readers will come in. After your beta readers, your editor will come in and tell you, if, eh, you're going on too long. You need to cut 10,000 words. And it's like, that's very common. Feel free to overwrite in your first couple drafts and cut back. You can always take things out. It's much harder to add more relevant content into what you already have without messing things up. Yeah, yeah. let me add on to that by, by, okay, go ahead, I'm sorry, Jen. I'm sorry, but we, we keep doing that. Um, that said, yeah. I think editors are looking for the perfect book that they don't have to do anything to. Well, yeah. They don't want to have to <laughs> tell you sell where a million copies. I know, yeah, I want a fairy godmother too, you know. <laughs> did, did you all see American uh, fiction? American, American fiction. I laughed so hard. I mean, I just, I just thought that was a perfect parody of what does go I can't, on i can't wait it's going to be so much fun because okay, I, I all the writers it. are going to be laughing their butts off you know <laughs> yeah Hilarious. i haven't seen it yet either i'm looking oh and a seven hundred and fifty thousand oh. dollar advance right in your dreams Whoa. i, I yeah. actually i actually know one writer who, who she actually made over a million on an advance for her debut novel i will i will not mention her name but oh my lord <laughs> it, it can happen but it's winning the, the lottery it's like it's winning the lottery Whoa. That's exactly right that's, that that's great um to to, to uh Ania's question and uh, question um my debut novel was when as it is published form started on about page 82 of the original first draft all right mm -hmm. and that's maybe more information than you need to know but a lot of us start out by explaining everything we can. And in today's market, you actually can't do that. You really have to start with action. And I think I'm talking about um, pretty much traditional mysteries, um, you know, th thrillers, um, PI mysteries. You know, there's a dead body on the first page and a PI mystery. I if think, not typically. the first page or the first chapter, at least, I, I'm, I'm telling people this, by chapter three, we have to know something about the murder that has happened or something mm -hmm. about the stakes. You can't put it seven chapters in. Not anymore. We no. can't do Charles Dickens. He couldn't get published today. Oh, that's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> he absolutely couldn't. I tell that. Yeah, I tell that to my writing classes sometimes. It's like you don't have the 
the carriage going up the long and describing the entire street yeah. and the city and all the people who've ever lived in the house <laughs> and why this person is coming there this it absolutely cannot happen i had the very good fortune to have a really good agent who i pitched to um send me a nice letter in rejecting uh becoming my agent saying two women trying to find their hotel and getting lost is not thrilling. <laughs> yes, it is. If you're in a Too foreign city without speaking the language and you see three <laughs> dangerous people smoking on the street corner as you pass by, yes, it is. Well, the way I was writing it was not particularly thrilling, according to Josh Gessler. Okay, but it can. But, uh, but again, um, but and, and that's sort of the point. We just don't have the op, you know, the luxury of doing it. Um, we pretty much have to get into the story um, in media race so that that the the reader is is engaged in it. And I think people who are writing today um, understand that. And Barbara yeah, says to know it's, it's Charles Dickens was paid by the word, which is why he could write so much. But he yeah. also knew what he was writing about. I mean, mm -hmm. even when he's talking about Magwitch in the graveyard, and you had you had that feel when he's talking about Miss mm -hmm. Haversham in the mansion. You felt it. You were there. You could see it mm -hmm. in your mind, and that's writing what you know. He was a genius. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, chicken. Uh, chickens. <laughs> Ch uh, that's also <laughs> Charles Dickens, but for short, chickens got paid by the word. Yeah, mm -hmm. I suppose there's something to that. But we, uh, on the other hand. All this sounds like, oh, right to some formula about body on page three. Can't do that either. It's, you know, our. Not formula, no, a guideline. A guideline. Get yeah. some yeah. action going, show some stakes. I always tell people, orient them. You know, put that one tagline, London, 1830. At least let them know the time and place. Mm -hmm. So to, to help them into the story. I mean, you can do it in the story, but. Don't make the reader ask questions in the first page or two that are like, pull them out of the story. I tell them a story should be a very smooth ride. You don't have potholes. You don't have speed bumps. You don't have twists and turns. One smooth ride. And the reader should be gliding along and realize that they can't put this book down because they're so invested in the story. And they, they just can't stop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's um, great. Again, writing what you know. We read a lot. Writers read so much. And we know what's good. You you develop the ear and the eye for what's good, what's not good. And you know that when you've written something that sounds like some of the good stuff you've read, that's when you're solid. And when you're not, when you have somebody read it out loud, it'll sound bad. If it's if it's bad, it's gonna sound bad. And you're like, oh, did I really write that? And that's the going back and the editing. It's it's a process of always correcting. You cannot edit a blank page, but you can go back and improve what you've done. But don't improve forever. Sometimes the story's got to get out, and the perfect is the enemy of the good. You cannot write the perfect novel. Even Hemingway couldn't. Nobody could. Nobody ever has, although To Kill a Mockingbird comes really, really close. But, <laughs> but folks, make your art make it matter get a good story get other people to say that's a good story and get it out that's the important part uh what you know is make sure it sounds real and true and something that matters you're here yeah so bonner is asking any more questions folks because i think we're going to have to wrap up very soon so eight o'clock yeah. yeah, it's just eight o'clock and I think we're supposed to go for a little bit longer, but um, the questions have been excellent and I'd love to yes, know if there's you, anything everybody. else. Yeah, really appreciate it. When I, uh, I the, the Zoom is Zoom is a little more awkward for me uh, from, from a teaching point of view. Not only are we sort of stepping on each other as, as we try to talk, but um, I, I run a very interactive classroom. I like questions. Come on, guys. <laughs> Okay, now that's a thank you. Okay. Okay, um, what are some of the esoteric things that the audience knows that they would love to put in a story? What's what's the really good stuff other than poisons and ways of good. murder and how to hide a body? Uh, what are the really cool things <laughs> that people would love to see in a story or put in a story? 
All right. This is your participation now. Come on, Pam. Come on, let's go. Come on. We got people on here. <laughs> we got a lot of people here who have probably a lot of really freaky ideas. Ah. Pottery. See, there you go. Okay. Thank you so much, Sally, because pot, I mean, I don't know anything about pottery. studio. what I love to, would you love to, to read a book about a pottery studio and learn a little bit about what goes on there? <gasps> Tornadoes. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, for pottery. How about putting a bomb in a kiln? When somebody fires the kiln at a certain heat, the bomb goes off. Boom. I didn't go there, but that's great. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Annie. Is so oh, okay. okay. Bonner's uh, got a shill. <laughs> yeah. Good to know. Right. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Annie um is is actually I've never met, but she is a reader who is um actually Annie reads pretty much Annie's always posting about books she reads. So I, you know, if she likes it, I'm there. Great atmosphere. Tony Hillerman. Yes, exactly. Uh, thank you, dear. And again, Tony Hillerman had people who said, oh, if you take out the Native American stuff, you might have something here. Oh, yeah. You don't listen Absolutely. to people who tell you to change your story. Just ignore Thank them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for saying that. Yeah. Um, awesome. You guys are great. And boy, did he know that. Okay, I mean, I... he's actually been accepted by the, the Navajo people for knowing mm -hmm. and accurately representing their culture. Writing what you know, that's a part of it right there. He respected it enough to do the research, to understand, and to accurately portray it. That's that's when the adage applies. Uh, question uh, back okay. to the humanity. I think on TV, I think you can overuse the F word, and it's, it's a shortcut for writing good prose. I think you probably have all experiences. It's like, why, why do they write this? So misusing the, the word is fine with me. I don't care. But if you use it 10 times in a sentence, you ju you're just a lazy writer. You're a lazy it, script. Yeah. Writer. But if you're talking about the street, also, it's different from talking about, you know, the, the tea room and the palace. Yeah. It is <laughs> it is knowing who the people are speaking. I, I usually use if if there's profanity, it's usually the bad guys using it. Because mm -hmm. that's how they talk, because that's the world they live in. And it's not excessive, but it's more than everybody else uses. So that's a way right. of revealing I, character by. Well, yeah, by, by doing that. Uh, this is not a book, but um, I recently went on vacation and binge watched the entire Ted Lasso series. And there is one of the characters in Ted Lasso who is in, it, it is is profane to the point of using those words at least three times in every sentence. Captain F bomb. And it, <laughs> yeah, and 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 Roy Kent is an amazing character, and that is his character. It is it is who he is. I'll never Probably speak grow that up in way. Sheffield or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One of those things. Yeah, um, and. And Faye, I appreciate your mentioning Faye Kellermanahi. Um, she's lovely. Um, her books have been, I haven't read one in quite a while, but her books are um, similarly evocative and they do, that you learn, you know what, you learn something every time you read one of her books, kind of like Tony Hillerman's, you know, like you learn about a lot about the culture. Again, and what I'm trying to do for Maine in my series of like, there's more stories about Maine than just Stephen King. I mean, those are great, but not everybody reads Stephen King. And mm -hmm. my stories are showing Maine in another light. And I say, if you haven't been to Portland, it makes you want to go there. Although I have increased the murder rate in Maine by several thousand percent, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> ooh, 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 wait. About murder on the Orient Express meets dark academia, where... A teacher is murdered by an entire junior class. Seriously, you must write that book. I'm I'm sorry. This is uh, that is awesome. That is totally awesome. Bodily discovered a lot. Okay, everybody, see that, guys? Yes. And yeah. it's trapped you in the school. You want to read that? It had to be these students. It couldn't be an outsider. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Trapped in the school. Oh my God, that's so great. I wrote about a town manager who was killed, and everybody in town has got a reason to kill him, but they all point to the wrong person. <laughs> mm. Question about politics. Yeah. I avoid politics totally, totally. Mm -hmm. Just don't go there. Don't do it on Facebook. Don't, you know. 
Yeah, you'll always alienate someone. No matter what you write, you're going to alienate someone. Yeah, especially and if you have absolutely no opinions on anything. Who's going to want to read it? So again, <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, oh yeah, and her husband. Yeah, her husband. I'm sorry, oh yeah, her husband. Well. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, her husband. Right. Yeah, Tabitha, Tabitha King's husband <laughs> there. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, no, she's talking about about Jonathan Killerman yeah. here, but yeah, he's he's great, awesome. Yeah, and Tabitha books and Tabitha's books. Okay. To end on a mysterious you know note, should... does anyone know why that light is flashing behind me? <laughs> That's the police coming. That's your ride. It's a ghost or something. I, but there's no light in here that accounts for that happening. Well, it's a mystery. Now we can write a story about was... it. See, it, it, go, it moves when I, I don't know. It's a ghost. Anahi, thank you for your kind words. Much appreciated. Thank Please. you. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm around on social media. If anybody who's listening tonight wants to get in touch and say hello or something like that, it would be a real pleasure. I'm actually local to Chelmsford. So the Chelmsford Library is one of my treasured places. Some of my books are in there. Please help yourself. And thank you, everybody, for attending. And thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, OK. And see your friends in Drake. Oh, my God, that's good. And now, hey, uh, go to my website, and uh, I'm going to actually type in my email here and drop me a line. My thing is Okay, oh, I can do that, too. Oh, Let oh me... wait, wait, wait. That's that's the website. Okay. <laughs> did I spell it right? Yeah, it looks like I did. Okay, that's me. Please feel free to get in touch um, if there's there anything you want to okay. talk about or ask. I love I love chatting with writers. Thank you. Yes, you know, the, the best thing is when we connect with fans. There's a lot of writers who yeah. prefer to be in a room by themselves and locked up, but you can do that for a while. But it's really nice to get out and meet with people who love good writing <laughs> and are great readers. I talked with the book club last week, and they were all so enthusiastic about just all books and getting together to talk about them. Thank you so much. Without readers, we would just be writing diaries. <laughs> so we really appreciate everybody's attention. <laughs> There's okay. a question Last in question. the Q&A about getting, getting started with writing your great idea. And honestly, my answer is start in the middle, start in the end, start at whatever part is interesting you, and then build out around it to get yourself going. Right. It really works. Right. Um just to add on to that a little bit, if you think about it as, as something with peaks and valleys, if you're envisioning something, you're envisioning a bunch of peaks. Okay, write your peaks down, write the ones that you can see, no matter where, as Jen said, where they are, and then you connect them after a while. Mm -hmm. How many hours a day do we write? Uh, from zero to <laughs> six, yeah. I'd say. Yeah. yeah, same here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Jack London, <laughs> Today, at the, near the end of his life, was writing about 16 hours a day. And he was selling all the stories that were not being bought when he was starting out. And he was really peeved about that. <laughs> if you read Martin Eden, you know, it's like, you'll understand where he was coming from. It's like, I'm working so hard and now they're buying it all, but they didn't buy it before when I, they didn't know my name. Changed, yeah. <laughs> but I can't sit at a desk for more than six hours. I just physically, it's tired. One needs, one needs to get up and walk around. Yes. Yeah. That's absolutely I mean, some people right. say, treat it like a job, you know, start at nine, stop at five. And I'm like, most people aren't that, not diligent, but, uh, or disciplined, just, just aren't going to do it for that long. Like you say, you mm -hmm. know, it, it does, you got to get up, move around, do other things. And oh, that's, you, you got to get your subconscious working. You can't just get your conscious mind working, activate your subconscious, take a shower, go for a walk, play a sport, do something else because the subconscious is where the really, really good stuff comes from. Things that you know, but not sure that you absolutely know you know. But the, mm -hmm. the dark heart of, of humanity, you know, things like that will come up. The, the really good idea for your story, not, not just the method of murder of the character, but all the fun stuff is going to come up like that. So work and also play. Mm -hmm. Yes. But if I wanted a nine to five job, I would day. still be doing that. I don't want this to be a nine to five job. But, no, you know, no. When it's a job, it's not fun. 
This should yeah. be something you love and you can't wait to get to. And you have so much fun doing it when it's going well. Yeah. It doesn't always go well, but that's, you got to get to that point. You've got to get in the zone. You've got to work diligently enough that you're in the zone a lot to mm -hmm. get to that point. And now he wants to know how okay. we keep fear at bay. Write it on the page. Ray Bradbury said it best. Write the things that scare you. Well, you don't have to mm -hmm. show it to anyone. You never have to show it to anyone. Just write it out. Yeah. Angela Here. wants to know any advice on trying to craft a premise you're excited about. Starting is, is yeah. challenging. Yes. What it's... excites you about that? Write that and just and start from there. Jen, any thoughts on any, that? Any final words? Um, I do. I, we're, we're the luckiest people in the world. We get to do what we love. Um, we we yeah. sell it to people who seem to enjoy it and tell us so. If you don't like it, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> we make stuff <laughs> up and we get paid we, for it. I mean, what's not great about that? <laughs> we really have yeah, the best. Right, right. There's a lot of vetching, but it's a great job. Although we lie, yeah, one... there are truths revealed in those lies. Very well said. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'd encourage people to pay attention to all the what ifs that um, occur to you during the day, because mm -hmm. that's where your imagination is is taking off. And that's where a lot of stories come from. Mm -hmm. What and if I rolled a dead body down that hill? Mm. <laughs> I know. We're always... Okay. When we're, when we're driving by a, a forest patch, we might look over and go, that'd be a good place to hide someone. Nobody goes there. I do that. that. Yes. I do that. I yep. do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Occupational hazard, but yes, any undergrowth, yep. overgrowth, I, that's three at the bottom. Yeah. Oh, wait. State parks where and, nobody goes off the trail. Exactly. Yep. Right. Yep. And I was looking, I was looking at a, at a house uh, a little while back and there was this long, narrow closet. No, I didn't think it would be awkward to hang close there. I thought, God, that would be a great place to hide a body. Yep. That's probably why it was built. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go. What if? <laughs> How do you keep <laughs> daughter thinks I'm mad? No. My... no, you're not mad. You just have a great no. creative imagination. And there are a lot right. of us out there, so don't worry about it. No, no, we, we think differently from other people. It's like, well, everybody else is thinking, well, well, that's the worst thing that could happen. And I'm usually like, no, no. How about if, <laughs> and you go on from there, you can, and you can always make it worse. <laughs> you can. <laughs> Every plane flight is is a cause for concern for us of the things that are running in our head. Every every train, every time you get in the car, what could go wrong? Like Bonner said, just waiting for your friend to come back with a luggage. Simple, but you're in a foreign country. You don't speak the language. There's people all about that you know are dangerous and will take advantage of you. And what happens from there? It's what happens there. What you know. And then that feeling. That's how you deal with the fear. You you're a little bit afraid, you're concerned, you 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 just enhance that. And then you write about that. Well, I think the fear of not being published is possibly <laughs> part of that question. What if I write this and nobody wants it? And that's kind of a constant. You know, you, you never you never really made it, but you if you get rejected, you just write something else. That's how you deal with fear. You just write something else. And then years later, they will come back like Jack London's work and say, gosh, what else do you have? And you, you have this whole inventory. Well, here you go. <laughs> Got a lot of books there. Um, I like my woman, 17 I Trump novels. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Um, a woman I interviewed a couple of three weeks ago, um, who's a well-known writer. Um, I won't mention her name. For her first three novels were rejected. She's extremely well known right now, and um, she got her her agent when an uh, what do you call them an intern with one of the agents who'd rejected her who said, "Oh, I really liked your story. Is it still available?" This is eight years later. Yeah, and yeah. she said, "Yeah." She oh, said, no. "Yes," and that woman brought it, and this woman has seventeen awesome books out right now. Just keep going. I Just can tell going. you dozens of horror stories like that of, uh, yeah. oh, what a great story. It's like, yeah, you turned it down four mm. years ago. Yeah, how nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. One person's opinion honestly doesn't matter. There might be 20 yeah. people more that really love it. You, you, 
You can't just pin it all on one person ever. Or even 50 or more, because on a panel at Crime Bake, all of these best-selling authors held up one of their best-selling books and told how many times it had been rejected. The uh -huh. average was 50. And I said, why would you want to deal with a profession or that doesn't know a good book if it comes up and bites them in the butt? <laughs> If it takes that long to publish something that's that good, what chance do 99% of, of the other authors have? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the guy who wrote the <laughs> American fiction, the screenplay was based on, wrote that book 21 years ago. Exactly. And not, really? not a whole lot of people read it, to be honest. They're all going to read it now. Few people mm -hmm. have the temerity to keep going for 20 years in something that they're not very successful at writers mm -hmm. are obsessive and what you say mad types because we are willing to do that but it might take 20 years to write that really one good novel i know somebody she made a very good splash she writes thrillers and people are jealous of her because she seemed to explode out of the gate and i talked with her and she said well you know i wrote 20 novels before that b.a yeah. shapiro who wrote um the art forger she wrote uh, nine yeah, novels yeah. that did not sell, could not sell before that. She was giving up and her husband said, one more, just one more try. Just go do it. Um, Two of my favorite authors, Don Winslow and Adrian McKinty, were giving up. They had been in the trenches for 20 years. They had had books. Yep. They had success. They had good reviews, but they, they could not break out. And then all of a sudden, it seemed like overnight, both of them, ba-boom, ba-boom, and now ba superstars. Good job. So folks, yep. stick with it Excellent. if you love it. Stick with it if you love it. And if you don't, you know, become a tennis pro or something. <laughs> right what you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Is everyone ready to sign off? Or do you think everyone else wishes? We I'm not sure if we're supposed to. I don't know what we're supposed no, to do good. right now, but. We'll be here tomorrow. Okay. If you want. We'll. Jenny, is the, are, you, are you on here? Do we, do we have a protocol for this? I'm not sure. I think we just. I'm not sure either. I'm the. Yeah. See, I can I can talk writing and publishing all night. So if anybody wants we to. Could, stay we could. <laughs> we could. Yeah, we could actually keep socking. I'm sure we could. Yeah, please stay inspired. Um, you know, it, it, if there's ever a time you can't do it, don't do it. But um, keep on, keep on, keeping on when you can. Um, okay. Good night, Anne. Here. Thank you guys for coming. Everybody, okay. people are slinking away into the darkness. Yeah, we're losing <laughs> the darkness. A bunch of people. Now, see, that's a good title. I slinking it. away into the darkness. Good, good going, Thank you, Larry. Larry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. And well, remember, which... reviews are really helpful to authors. They cost you nothing, and good reviews really help author success. Thank you. Thank you. Well, night, what should we do here, guys? I'm just going to the leave button. <laughs> okay. We're all leaving all right. a banner. Sh <laughs> all right. I'm going to leave. Here I'm going to leave you. I'm here not going to see you by myself. Are you kidding me? One, two, one, two, three. Oh.